the myth of Galileo's torture. Um, truth can be very hard to find, particularly in history. We're dependent upon the historical records. Uh, we don't always understand what we see. We can't go back and ask people, especially after uh, they've died. Um, that leaves us with a certain lack of evidence, but uh, perhaps uh, even more um, disconcerting is the fact that sometimes there's deliberate obfuscation of the evidence. And uh, falsehood, once it gets started, often persists because it feeds into narratives that people want to keep going. And the, uh, the story, if the story fits the narrative, it's very difficult to destroy the story, as we've seen in a number of different areas. Um, and the story of Galileo is perhaps a classic of this uh, problem. And uh, I'm deeply indebted to uh, an article uh, by uh, uh, M.A. Finocciaro um, that Galileo was imprisoned and tortured for advoca advocating Copernicanism. And Galileo goes to jail and other myths about science and religion. Interestingly enough, uh, edited by Ronald Numbers and published by Harvard University Press. Voltaire, in 1728, in an essay entitled uh, Descartes and Newton, says the, the great Galileo, at the age of fourscore, groaned away his days in the dungeons of the Inquisition because he had demonstrated by irrefragable proofs the motion of the earth. This was uh, the standard belief. Uh, Giuseppe Baretti, at about the same time, 1757, the celebrated Galileo was put in the Inquisition for six years and put to the torture for saying that the earth moved. Um, Italo Moreau, in the History of Intolerance in Europe in 1979, moving quite a bit closer to today, says, to say that Galileo was tortured is not a reckless claim, but it is simply to repeat what the sentence says. To specify that he was tortured again about his intention is not a risky deduction. But it is again to report what the text says. These are observation reports, not magical incantation, intuitions. Proved facts, not uh, Kabbalistic introspections. Um, last week we talked about uh, uh, Susan Mazur's uh, interview with David Koch in the Altenburg 16. Uh, where Koch says, that's interesting, it's hard to believe the Catholic professionals would support the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin. As our uh, comments said, there's a big shape, shake up going on, which is what I've been reporting. And Koch goes on to say, this is, by the way, the David Koch that, uh, of the Koch brothers that everybody's uh, uh, vilifying these days. Uh, after all, Galileo was in prison for years for saying the world was round. <coughs> This is the impression that gets out. Evolution's a leap of a lot more extreme than Galileo's concept. Uh, this is part of the narrative that you get if you're educated today. Now, Nicholas Copernicus in 1543 wrote on the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, obviously in Latin, and um, made uh, quite an impression at the time. Uh, Galileo Galilei supported Copernicus and he was persecuted, he was tried, he was condemned by the Catholic Church and he spent the last nine years of his life under house arrest. But the question is, was he in fact imprisoned and tortured? Well, Galileo according to Finocciaro didn't start out believing in Copernicanism. Now, I think this is the one place where Finocciaro's case is weak. He simply states this. He says his theory of motion was compatible with it. Certainly it was. Uh, because if things are moving along at the same speed, they feel like they're standing still. 
So you couldn't tell uh, whether the earth was moving by simply feeling it. Um, direct sense experience was against the movement of the earth, but Galileo had a way of explaining that. Traditional physics was against it, and that made it a little more difficult because Galileo didn't really have a lot of evidence. And scriptural passages were, I think, in balance against it. We're going to come back and look at those another day. Uh, however, in 1597, he wrote a letter to Johannes Kepler confessing belief in Copernicus's theory. This is not in the, in the book itself. I found it from other sources. And that suggests that Galileo really was privately interested in Copernicus's theory before um, 1609. But um, he didn't make a big deal of it because he didn't have a lot of really good evidence for the Copernican theory. In 1609, Galileo turned his telescopes to the heavens, and what he saw suddenly changed the way he looked at the universe, and he felt it should change the way everybody looked at the universe. He saw mountains on the moon. What's the big deal about mountains on the moon? Well, the moon was assumed to be this big silvery thing, all made out of quint quintessence. Remember, there were four elements on Earth, fire, air, water, and earth. And there was a fifth element out of which the planets, the sun, the moon, the stars were made out of. And that fifth element was the perfect element by the philosophers. And so what happened up there was immutable, unchangeable, and that was good. Well, if there are mountains on the moon, then the moon isn't just this silvery smooth thing. And all of a sudden, the philosophers who assumed that the heavens were perfect started having to explain something. You see, spheres are perfect. And the moon was assumed to be a sphere. But it would have to be a perfect sphere, not with mountains like here on Earth. Multiple stars he saw that were not visible to the naked eye. That means that the universe wasn't created solely for man's ability to see it, at least without a telescope. Um, there were dense collections of stars, stars that seemed to be clustered together. Um, there were, in fact, what we would now call galaxies. Jupiter had four satellites that went around it. Well, you could argue that they went back and forth, um, but what it suggested was that there, were, there was another center to the visible, well, at least the visible to the telescope universe, rather than Earth itself. Jupiter had things that went around it. Who says that the Earth couldn't go around the sun instead of the sun around the Earth? And then the moon goes around the Earth. And so there's all kinds of possibilities that suddenly open up when you no longer have to have um, everything centered on us and what we can see. Uh, there were phases of Venus. And this was particularly interesting because this had been predicted by the enemies of Copernicus. Well, if your theory is so, so good, why we should be able to see phases of Venus as it goes around the sun. Now they found them. This is what you would call a novel fact. It's, it was hugely important. And finally, there are sunspots, which meant that not only the moon has these imperfections we can see, but the sun has imperfections and the sun turns because the sunspots moved across the sun's face from day to day. And that meant that you had a universe where the sun was not just this smooth yellow globe that was giving us light. And the philosopher's picture was starting to unravel. And with the phases of Venus, a new picture was starting to come up. That meant that Copernicanism 
was viable, you could make an actual case for it. And so Galileo started to do that. Well, when he did, he came under criticism and perhaps the biggest criticism that was raised was that Copernicanism was against scripture. Now, the Catholic Church has an interesting relationship with scripture and seems to be able to understand some things allegorically. For some reason, this was not one of them. And probably part of the reason for that was that the church had just been under severe criticism by the Protestant Reformation for not taking the Bible seriously enough, not actually listening to it, for explaining certain kinds of things away. And so the the church had become much more conservative in its biblical interpretations. And so it went from kind of leaning towards the allegorical, don't take it too seriously side, now careening back towards the really take it seriously, take it literally side. And as we will see, there was another careen in the opposite direction um, when they ran against Galileo. So Galileo decided to refute the biblical arguments, and he used the arguments that we would use today, I think. Um, he wrote two long private letters, one of them to the Grand Duchess uh, Dowager Christina, which didn't get published, uh, another one to Benedetto Castelli, which was actually earlier, and that one did get published, uh, but actually got him into trouble. He was then reported to the Inquisition in 1615. Now keep in mind, uh, 1517 is the Protestant Reformation, so this is less than 100 years after the 95 Theses were nailed to the door of the Wittenberg uh, Church. And that helps you to understand a little more of what's going on. Protestants and Catholics still have, hadn't come to some kind of an understanding, and there was still a lot of war between Protestant and Catholic um, uh, political institutions. Now. He actually had a pretty good case, and he wasn't summoned to Rome to defend himself, which is interesting. Uh, but late in the year, he went on his own. In retrospect, it's probably not a good idea. He did win the intellectual arguments pretty handily, but the people who were convinced against their will were of the same opinion still, and so uh, they and some of them were in the Inquisition proper. And uh, Cardinal Robert Bellamini uh, gave Galileo a warning, forbidding him to hold or defend the view that the earth moved, and gave him a written copy of the warning, and Galileo agreed to comply. Because contrary to public opinion nowadays, Galileo was actually a very good Catholic. Well, mostly good. He did have three illegitimate children, but that wasn't that uncommon back then. The uh, Index of Prohibited Books published a decree. They didn't actually mention Galileo's name, but it, they declared that the Earth's motion was physically false and contradicted scripture. So they kind of came down already on one side of the uh, question. And they argued that Copernicus's book was banned. No, they didn't argue, they stated that Copernicus's book was banned until revised. So that's where things stood. Uh, Galileo was a good Catholic. He was told to do what he was told to do and so he held his peace until about 1623, about eight years later. At that point, Cardinal Maffio Barberini, who was a good friend of Galileo's, became the Pope, chose the name Urban VIII. And uh, Galileo decided that this is a good time to write very carefully a dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. This was a dialogue between three philosophers, 
Salviati Sagredo is kind of the neutral observer. And uh, Simplicio. Now Simplicio had written a couple of philosophical treatises in the past. And he was long dead, so uh, this is obviously an imaginary conversation that was taking place. Um, and he was a relatively well-respected <coughs> philosopher. However, uh, the name Simplicio in, uh, uh, in Italian kind of carried the connotations of simpleton. And so uh, just by choosing the name, even though in the preface, preface it says why he chose the name, in fact, one could easily understand a hidden agenda behind that name. The book avoided biblical or theological arguments. Uh, basically didn't touch anything like that. Uh, Galileo knew that if he said anything, uh, he would be in trouble. And um, so he basically just simply tried to influence that. It argued that the Copernican system, Copernican system had better arguments than the Ptolemaic system. And one of the biggest arguments he had was on the tides. The earth moved and therefore the water sloshed and that's what caused the tides. Um, it's actually an argument that has since been abandoned and so I suppose from our point of view you could call it a bad argument. In fact, he was originally going to uh, title this work Argument Concerning the Tides. He thought he had the final uh, nail in the coffin. Now. What he was trying to do is thread a needle. That is to say there are better arguments for Copernicanism than there are for uh, the Ptolemaic system. But the Ptolemaic system could still be right. Um, of course, when you read it, you come away with the idea that, yeah, it could be right, but it's probably not. Um, he sent it to the church censor um, and got the censor's permission to publish the, uh, the book. And I, I guess, you know, if you read it straight and didn't understand the background of what was going on, it was just kind of over your head. But, uh, um, there were other people out there who caught what was going on and perhaps they, the real twister was he, uh, Pope Urban VIII had a, an opinion about all this and basically it boiled down to a well, God could do anything he wanted to and how would you know. And so at the end of the book, he put Pope Urban VIII's arguments in the mouth of Simplicio. Now, if he had been a little um, more savvy, I think he would have put it in the mouth of Sagredo, maybe, maybe even Salviati, although since Salviati kind of represented the, Copernic the Copernican system advocate, um, that would probably be a stretch. But he put it in the mouth of Simplicio, and here's the quotation, or at least the, the relevant part of it, there's a paragraph above I've omitted. As to the discourses we have held, and especially this last one concerning the reasons for the ebbing and flowing of the ocean, that we're in the tides argument, I am really not entirely convinced. But from such feeble ideas of the matters I have formed, I admit that your thoughts seem to be more ingenious than many others I have heard. I'm not convinced, but yeah, it sounds pretty good. I do not therefore consider them true and conclusive. You haven't persuaded me because, indeed, keeping always before my mind's eye a more solid doctrine than I that I once heard from a most eminent and learned person and before which one must fall silent. That's Pope Urban VIII. Uh, 
I know that if asked whether God in his infinite power and wisdom could have conferred upon the watery elements its observed reciprocating motion using some other means than moving its containing vessels, both of you would reply that he could have, and that he would have known how to do this in many ways which are unthinkable to our minds. For this, I forthwith conclude that this being so, it would be excessive boldness for anyone to limit and restrict the divine power and wisdom to some particular fancy of his own. Yeah, that mechanism might work, but who knows how God actually did it. And that was Urban VIII's argument. And it's almost said that out loud. Well, he could have used Segredo, maybe Salviati, although that'd be a stretch. And it probably would have been okay. But he put it in Simplicia, and of course, that's the stupid argument. His enemies figured out really quickly what was going on, and they reported him to the Inquisition again. This time, a document was discovered in his file that forbade him to discuss the Earth's motion in any way, whatever. Now, how that document got there is not clear. Was it really part of the originals? Did somebody put it in with the specific intention of using it against Galileo? Well, Galileo denied in knowledge of such a document, and he showed his certificate from Bellarmini, which did not have that stipulation. So he had, he says, that's not what you gave me. So a plea bargain was struck. Galileo would plead guilty to defending Copernicanism, and the Inquisition would drop the charge of violating the special injunction. So that's what happened. Galileo then in the Inquisition court, because the Inquisition was in fact a legal proceeding, admitted the book was written in such a way as to give readers the impression of defending the Earth's motion. Yeah, I can see how somebody would, would read that and, and think. But I didn't really mean that. It was just that I was too conceited to realize what it, what it sounded like. He was found to be guilty of vehement suspicion of heresy, which is not the lowest uh, charge, but it's not the highest charge either. The highest charge probably would have meant death at the stake. Um, and there were two parts to the heresy. Number one, that the earth moves, and number two, the Bible is not a scientific authority. He was forced to abjure those beliefs. I really don't believe that. Honest, I don't. The dialogue was banned. And the sentencing document is interesting to read because it gave the history of the dispute. It gave a couple of other details that are really important to our study today. And describing an in interrogation, it says, quote, because we did not think you had said the whole truth about your intention, we deemed it necessary to proceed against you by a rigorous examination. And when people are reading that rigorous examination, a chill goes up their spines. Here you answered in a Catholic manner, though not without prejudice to the above mentioned things confessed by you and deduced against you about your intention. And finally, it had an additional penalty. We condemn you to formal imprisonment in this holy office at our pleasure. You stay in the Inquisition dungeons. Now, that document, the sentencing document, got spread all over everywhere. And Galileo's abjuration was also published. And people drew the obvious conclusion. And as far as we can tell, this is a lesson to others, and it was also a way of saying the Pope is strong on defense of the faith. The text clearly says prison. The text clearly implies torture, that rigorous examination. 
That was how they did it in those days. And it implies that Galileo had passed the torture test and after his torture he had said, no, I really don't believe that. It is very understandable how the myth, myth of torture in jail grew up. They're in the documents, there's no question. The problem is that isn't all the documents we have. In 1774 and 1775, about 140, 150 years after uh, the 1633 sentencing and so forth, correspondence from that year became available from the Tuscan ambassador to Rome. Tuscany had its own little Italian city-state at the time, and Rome was kind of an Italian city-state only run by the papacy. And um, there were letters to Galileo. There were letters to um, uh, Rome, uh, the Vatican itself. And according to the letters, Galileo left Florence for Rome and stayed at the Tuscan embassy for a while. Um, he then went to the Inquisition and for a short while he stayed at the prosecutor's apartment and was allowed a servant. The apartment had uh, six rooms or something. It was a pretty, uh, pretty nice place to stay, actually. And the servant went back and forth to the Tuscan ambassador's office and, and got him food. So not exactly what you call jail. He then went back to the Tuscan embassy after that particular part of the Inquisition was done. And then in June 20 to 24, he stayed at the Inquisition. Now, it's not clear. It looks like probably he stayed at the prosecutor's apartment again. It's possible he may have spent two, three nights in jail there. But um, certainly uh, uh, not years. He then moved to the Via Medici, Medici, I'm, I'm told in Italian, owned by the Duke of Tuscany uh, in Rome. He then went to the Archbishop of Siena's place to live for five, year, uh, for five months under house arrest. Again, he couldn't go and do whatever he wanted to, but he's not in jail. He then went to his own house at uh, Arcetri, or is it Arcetri? The Italians here can correct me. Um, which was just outside of Florence to live under house arrest. He was actually allowed to go to Florence at one point because he had some health issues that needed taken care of. And then finally, he died. Um, <clears throat> so he spent the last nine years of his life under house arrest, but it's not exactly jail. Now, about 100 years later, at the end of the 19th century, uh, there were court proceedings that were published and assimilated. And it turns out that the minutes of the Inquisition meeting was available on June 16, 1633, which was chaired by the Pope. And, um, and here's what uh, the Pope had to say according to the court stenographer. His Holiness decided that the same Galileo is to be interrogated even with the threat of torture. Hmm, the threat, but not actually torture. And that if he holds up after a vehement abjuration at a plenary meeting of the Holy Office, he is to be condemned to prison at the pleasure of the sacred congregation, and he is to be enjoined that in the future he must go, he must no longer treat in any way, in writing or orally, of the earth's motion or the sun's stability, nor of the opposite on pain of relapse, and that the book written by him and entitled Dialogo di Galileo Galilei Lincio is to be prohibited. Interesting, they shortened the name to Dialogo. And um, part of the questioning that was done of Galileo is recorded, and it's recorded in a kind of an interesting way um, having been told that from the book itself and the reasons advanced from the affirmative side, namely that the earth moves and the sun is motionless, 
he is presumed, as it is stated, that he holds Copernicus's opinion, or at least that he held it at the time. Therefore, he was told that unless he decided to proffer the truth, one would have uh, recourse to the remedies of the law and appropriate steps against him. Um, answer, I do not hold this opinion of Copernicus, and I have not held it after being ordered by injunction to abandon it. For the rest, I am in your hands. Do as you please. It's really odd because you hear this third person stuff and then Galileo will answer in first person. And it goes on and he was told to tell the truth, otherwise one would have recourse to torture. Answer, I am here to obey, but I have not held this opinion after the de determination was made, as I said. And since nothing else could be done for the execution of the decision, after he signed, he was sent to his place. I, Galileo Galilei, have testified as above. That's, um, you know, I think there's no question that Galileo was threatened with torture. Now, the usual form of torture was what they call torture of the rope. What they do is they tie the wrist behind the back, and then they tie the wrist to a long rope, and then they suspend you from the rope maybe an hour, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on how much they needed to do to break you, I guess, um, with or without weights tied to the ankles, depending on, uh, and then uh, they might drop you a little bit, not have you quite hit the floor, kind of bounce, and uh, you could measure how high the bounce was, and I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> kind of grisly to think about. Obviously, it would do damage to one's arms that way. Galileo was 69, an old man at the time, arthritis. He showed no evidence of arm damage after he was interrogated. Um, interestingly, the victim's cries and groans were standardly recorded. That really hurt. Oh, I'll do whatever you want, whatever. But there were none from Galileo. The victim had to ratify the confession 24 hours later. Galileo never ratified a confession 24 hours later. The inquisitors had to approve torture. You had to have a vote and say that's what needs to happen. And uh, we've already seen that he was threatened with torture according to His Holiness the Pope, but not. Uh, but there's no record that anybody said, yeah, it's time to torture him. Uh, the Roman Inquisition, uh, this is probably being a little generous, rarely tortured. Um, although it's probably fair to say that the Roman Inquisition was less likely to torture people than the Spanish Inquisition, for example, because the threat wasn't as strongly perceived in Rome as it was in Spain. They had just driven the Moors out and they weren't feeling too secure in their thrones. Um, Rules exempted old or sick people or children or pregnant women, which of course Galileo was both old and sick. Uh, clerics were supposed to be spared and in fact, Galileo had just received the clerical tonsure on April 5, 1631 in order to benefit from an ecclesiastic pension. Um, the reason for that is that laymen weren't supposed to touch your clerics. Uh, one couldn't be tortured less than 10 hours after one's last meal for what are probably obvious reasons. Um, uh, and uh, there's no evidence that there was a break of sufficient size for Galileo to be tortured that way. One couldn't be tortured unless the crime merited corporal punishment, and at least the final sentence was not one which merited corporal punishment. Old, now, in fairness, you could do other things. Old men, instead of being, have their hands tied behind their back and suspended on a rope, could have their feet put to the fire. Uh, clerics could be tortured as long as it was another cleric that was doing the torture. Uh, it's interesting how people justify these things. Um, 
And to be fair, the rules were often abused and disregarded. Um, one could do other things that were not quite complete torture. For example, one could be brought into a room where somebody else is being tortured and say, you know, um, if you don't uh, uh, give us what we want, why uh, this could be you. So you didn't just have to say, if you don't do that, uh, you could be tortured. You could, also, you could also actually show somebody being tortured. Or you could tie the victim up and uh, you know, get ready and then just not do it. So there were, there were other degrees that could have been done. Um, they, the uh, text makes a distinction between uh, territio realis, I'm probably butchering that, uh, versus territio verbalis. And uh, it's interesting. I, I guess you could say terrorize. Um, uh, would it be fair to call people who did this terrorists? I, I suppose so. Um, now, the June deposition makes no mention of possible intermediate st uh, steps. There are those who argue that Galileo was morally tortured. Frankly, I'd be one of them. Um, certainly, it would be very disconcerting if I were in his shoes, and knowing that if I continued to resist I, what, was, uh, what I was facing. Uh, the publicly available evidence for 150 to 250 years indicated that the myths were true. However, the publicly available evidence from the evidence that we have now was wrong. It was, in fact, a myth that Galileo was jailed and tortured. Now, my personal take is that Finocciaro makes a good case that Galileo's torture and imprisonment is, in fact, a myth. It was initially supported by the church, which had a reputation to uphold and wanted to terrorize Galileo's followers. It later was adopted by anti-church scientists and historians to make Galileo into a hero. You have to remember that Christians had martyrs. Protestants had martyrs. That's what the Fox's Book of Martyrs was all about. These were people who were not just tortured, they were killed. Scientists in Galileo thought they had a martyr. And in fact, the story, as you may remember, uh, although this part doesn't get into the legends quite so much anymore because people realize that you really can't back it up, uh, have Galileo immediately after his uh, recantation say, Eper si mueve, uh, nevertheless it moves. And that legend actually grew up pretty early. There's a Spanish painting from about uh, 25 years later or so that has Galileo in jail with that written in his cell. And then, of course, the story eventually, about 125 years later, uh, got into that Galileo said that at his trial. And uh, see, this is the real hero. He was tortured. He had to confess. He was, but he um, mainly st uh, stood. Well, of course, you wouldn't say that. If he had done that, why the uh, the entire proceedings would have been uh, uh, moved from vehement uh, suspicion of heresy to flat out heresy. That's not what you would do. I think that one of the lessons we have to learn about this is we have to be very careful about assuming that we know history. We are often uh, confused by accident. We don't have enough information. We are sometimes confused deliberately. Uh, Galileo is not the only example. For example, Sargon the Great brags in his um, inscriptions on his palace wall 
that he conquered Samaria. Turns out he did no such thing. He claimed the credit for the last years of Shalmaneser when Shalmaneser couldn't uh, make it public because he died before uh, Sargon uh, became king. But the timeline won't allow that. Maybe Sargon was one of the generals or something. Um, now, this does not nullify the church's mistake in condemning Galileo's opinion or its mistake in condemning Galileo, nor does it uh, justify its willingness to support a mistake by illegitimate means. I think the church was wrong here. Uh, creating a martyr out of one's opponent is not a good way of convincing others of the rightness of one's cause. Even creating a semi-martyr out of one's opponent is not a good idea. And creating a quarter martyr and lying about it to make him a complete martyr is a really big mistake. On the other hand, I think that from the science side, Claiming too much credit for one's intellectual and spiritual ancestors is not a recipe for trust either. And I think that both of these may apply to some uh, more contemporary um, arguments. I, I think we need to be very careful not to create martyrs when there aren't any, and that we need to be very careful to uh, say precisely what's happened and not exaggerate even a little bit, even for what we think is good effect. And with that, I will open things up for questions and comments. Yes? Just to clarify something about the Ptolemaic um, view, it was that the, the Ptolemaic system was that the everything Earth... Everything revolved around the Earth? Or? That's right, that the Sun and the Moon and the various planets revolved around the Earth with special ecocycles that would have them move backwards at certain times because if they saw that, they had to, you know, it, that had to be what they, what they did. So there was movement, I don't know... There was movement out, outside of the Earth, but the Earth itself sat still. Oh, okay. and, the, and the stars rotated around every 24 hours and 56 minutes, or no, 23 hours and 56 minutes. The sun rotated around every 24 hours. So that's what the church was objecting to. No, make, that's what the church thought was true. Well, I mean, they were objecting to the idea that the earth was not stationary. That's like right. Ptolemy, they were, they were objecting to the idea that the earth was not stationary. The... Uh, God has put the foundations of the earth, it will not be moved. Now we're going to go after some of those texts later on because I think that it's really important for us to deal with the problems because they have to do with how you use inspiration. Surely that's not what it meant. The text does not mean that. I mean, I've never taken it to mean that. Do you think that um, Galileo, is, Galileo is still the poster boy for science that it used to be? Oh, yeah. Well, because um, I think I read an article once, it was in a science magazine, that they suggested that he was a little bit mentally unstable. And it might have been because of the spiritual side of him. I don't know. But... Um, it just I was just wondering after I read that if maybe they were kind of taking a second look at the guy. Well, yes, there's been a whole lot of second looks at the guy. Um, and the reason for that is that, um, that the, uh, uh, that, you know, yet it still moves. The, the legend that was created out of Galileo has turned out not to be nearly as good as what it sounded like. And so uh, people have backed off a long ways. But the, the idea that Galileo was tortured and that he spent long time, years in prison hasn't made it, uh, hasn't gotten into the, uh, the historical community in quite the way that it should have. 
Um, it's my understanding that Copernicus was so afraid of the church he wouldn't allow his work to be published until after he was dead. That's true? He was afraid of people in the church. Um, and, and, he, and he did, uh, he actually saw the, the, um, the publication on his deathbed, so he actually did oh. see the book. Okay. But it was, yeah, it was after they couldn't really do too much to him. Do you know how it got published? <laughs> Who was the courage to do it? Not, no, not, uh, no one again. Well, I have read there, there, was a, um, there was somebody who believed in what he had to say uh, quite a bit, who was a printer, among other things, and managed to get it, uh, managed to get it published. So yes, I mean, there was suppression. There was definitely suppression going on. And uh, I think it spoke ill of the church. Uh, in I, I think that is one of the good things that came out of this whole thing was that uh, religious persecution uh, started to be seen f that, uh, for s what it was, which is uh, taking the prerogative of God and taking it on ourselves. Uh, you know, it, it's very interesting if you read uh, uh, Jesus and he talks about, you know, love your enemies. And he goes on to say, and then you'll be children of your father. For he sends the rain on the just and the just unjust, and he sends the sunshine on the good and the evil. And the point is that God trusts us with freedom. We need to be really careful about taking freedom away from other people. Now, of course, that also means that we need to be careful about letting these people teach our own kids when uh, uh, we don't think they're doing a good job because that's taking away freedom of our kids. But, uh, but that's a different issue from you know, destroying their livelihood. And I, that's one of the things we have to be, there's, there's, gonna, there's gotta be a balancing act there. And part of the balance is not, well, I, I think we can all be thankful that nobody dies at the stake these days for their beliefs. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this week, I was reading an article, and you might have seen it. It's regarding uh, Dr. Ben, I, I believe it's Ben Carson. Mm, I have not seen that one. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was, uh, he was invited, he's, well-known uh, scientist, physician, he separated the twins, uh, you know, he became famous and the neurosurgeon at Johns Hopkins. He's recognized yeah. by everybody in the entire world as uh, some, somebody who is uh, very knowledgeable in yeah. his field. And it's particularly inspiring because he came from the ghetto to begin with right. and uh, it's always nice to see those stories. He was invited by a university, I forgot the name of the university. He was invited to give a commencement or something like that. And there was a, a, there was a protest I think published. you may have heard of this. Go ahead. A, a protest published in which they use exactly the argument of Galileo. And they said, this man, he might be knowledgeable about uh, science, but it is amazing that he is trying to make the Bible a, s a scientific, reliable scientific document while ignoring what science has done, you know, based on facts. So that's the story. Now, I would like to say something else. I well, before you get off of that, um, I, I'd like to point out that I think that anybody who reads that and realizes who Ben Carson is goes, what? And then goes, I thought we were done with inquisitions. I think it's a huge mistake for the people who did that to do it. It's really bad public relations. <laughs> 
And uh, you know, I, I I think that any of us who start to try to clamp down and only allow our side to speak, uh, we're in trouble. And, and that's that's where I would like to uh, how to say mention another uh, anecdote. I do participate in uh, blogs, in especially Club Adventist, which uh, I consider, you know, you you are free to express your opinions. Well, uh, I was uh, trying to do that, and uh, I immediately was the target of how do you say. Uh, merciless attacks. Several individuals said, you are preaching heresy just because I disagreed on certain, uh, the way the certain prophecies were fulfilled in the past. They, they decided I was a heretic not worth listening to and a dangerous individual, <laughs> you know, in the Adventist community. So are we are we be beyond the torture? I mean, because this is psychological t torture. Now, well, anybody who doesn't know me probably thinks it, Nick is really crazy, he's heretic, and if uh, there was no freedom, total freedom, we would torture him. Well, uh, be, be thankful that these things have happened ahead of time because that way they, uh, they won't actually take you and string you up by a rope by your wrists. <laughs> let's, uh, let's be thankful that things have moved beyond that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, we can't make ourselves out to too much to be martyrs because, uh, you know, I, I've said some controversial things in blogs too on occasion in some of the areas that I've been. And, um, fortunately, um, nobody has come to my house to take me to a secret location. I am not shattered by black helicopters. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe some years in the future that may happen. Um, but uh, I think we can be thankful for the, uh, for the uh, relative restraint that we see today compared with uh, some other eras. Yeah, wh what I was trying to say is that the spirit that moved the inquisit uh, inquisitors still is still with us. And even I may be, I may have done the same thing. You know, it's human. Well, I I agree. I agree. Um, Go ahead, Dan Lovin. And yeah, it seems that no matter um, how we see things, we're always tempted to somehow right the ship by taking over the controls, as it were. And where it really goes wrong is when we seek to control the thoughts of another. I mean, if that was a solution. Well, God could have done it far more effectively without our piddling about it. You know, the fact that God in his almighty wisdom has seen that that's not a good idea is probably something that ought to give us pause yet. And the history of Galileo ought to give uh, us pause. Among if, many. It, yeah. It, if. Uh, if the solution were with force, then the church did the right thing. Uh, the church obviously did the wrong thing. That means that I think it's simple proof that the, that's not the solution. If solution was with force, then when the disciples offered swords to Jesus push the Christ's said, cause forward, he, you know, he would have said, yes, bring some more. <laughs> Well, and his response in, in Matthew is, you know, hey, if, I, if, I, if that was the way things were, I, I have 10,000 legions of angels, and the, the, the Romans didn't stand a chance against that. You know, it's... Uh, my, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. 
And it is so hard for us to understand that, even today. Years ago, I served on a union committee, which was invaded by a constituency, got very ugly. The situation was such that the union president had to cancel the meeting and disperse things. It was written up in the review in quite a different spirit. So I asked the editor why he couldn't tell the truth about what happened. His response was, Adventist members have enough trouble in their lives. We don't want them to hear any more from the church paper. Uh, well, you know, that, the problem is place. that if that gets out, people lose confidence in what you have to say, and then you might as well not have said it. I canceled my subscription. <laughs> in the book, People of the Lie, M. Scott Peck indicates that the ultimate evil is the desire to control somebody else. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and you can see the web that gets weaved by people who make it, want to make it sound worse than it is, so nobody will try that again. And all they did was create a martyr when there wasn't one. Observance through the years, when somebody in the church gets fired, and you want to know why they got fired, the answer is, if you knew what we knew, then you would understand. But they never tell you, because as often as not, it was not a good firing. So there is that, even in the church, there is a great deal of control and letting you know uh, just what. Early on, I was in, there was a picture of Ellen White and her family, and I th was it a daughter or a niece that had a big brooch on? And the Review and Herald brother and airbrushed it out of the picture. And of course somebody said, wait a minute, and they confessed that they had done so. But that kind of behavior, <laughs> that kind of behavior is uh, not acceptable in my light. Uh, you know, Ellen White says that the truth ought to be as clear as sunlight, or our actions should be as clear as sunlight. I resent it when my church tries to indoctrinate me falsely with something other than truth. Well, I think that um, this actually has application to certain uh, um, institutions right now that are having trouble with the creation and evolution controversy. We need to be really careful about how we uh, uh, have people lose their jobs over this kind of thing. Um, uh, I mean, I understand the, the balancing act, but I think that more information rather than less is the better approach. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big mistake and it will backfire on us big time uh, the more we have of trying to sweep it under the rug or trying to get rid of the people who are giving us trouble because that's, uh, that way we'll have a pure church. Because we won't have a pure church at the end. What we'll have is a bunch of people who are terrorized into the party line. And that's no more effective now than it was in the days of Galileo. I think we have to meet it, and we have to meet it head on, and it has to be open and, and above board. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons that we're going to have uh, our discussion next week is because I'm trying to see what we can do to actually meet the ideas head on in front of everybody rather than trying to say, well, don't listen to them because they're heretics. I don't know. Time will tell as to whether we're doing it the right way, but at least I feel like it's the right general approach. Um, two points. Number one, um, these kinds of issues become very sensitive uh, because of the legal implications. Um, in, in other places I've been at before I came here, you know, you know people are working nearby next door, 
and you come after a long weekend and everything's been cleaned out, they're no longer there, and nobody knows a thing. And why is that? Was there some big secret to protect? I suspect when the lawyers get involved, then you, you begin to wonder what words are allowed and which ones are not, uh, because you don't want to incur another litigation over what you said to whoever, who then said to whoever else, and you know the uh, deaf phone, the way that works. Um, and that's one complication that really throws a monkey wrench in our ability to know the truth. But any conflict anywhere always results in the first victim being the truth. And lawyers are not helping the matter. They make the matter far more murkier for everybody to know. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, wait, a, wait a minute. Let me get to so, so that it's recorded and it's easy to, for uh, the people on the internet to understand. Oh, you got one. Here After observing and reading park. about Homo sapiens, it's my conclusion that God would have been better off if he'd have stopped at the animals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> there's certainly a, a grain of truth to that. Uh, I agree, Phil. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that the Press Enterprise this morning has a, an article about the La Sierra situation and the firing of uh, another biology teacher and three of the board members, which is of interest, unfortunately. You know, I, I think that sometimes it's probably better for us to get out the truth for the simple reason that if we don't, there will be p plenty of people who uh, are willing to put out uh, rumors that fit their own worldview. And uh, so it's going to be painful if that's what happens, but I think we're better off telling the truth than, than not uh, in the long run. And I, I think the lawyers are sometimes so concerned in keeping us out of court uh, that they sometimes put us in a position to where we, uh, where we lose the battle for hearts and minds, which is where it really is at. Completely in the dark. Yeah. Well, it's uh, 11.33, and I know that uh, many of you have other places to go. This this is probably a good place to stop. Um, next, um, next week, we'll have Fritz Guy and Brian Bolian, and we're going to talk about the Rakia. It's a good old-fashioned Bible study, only it's going uh, to be going back to the original Hebrew. It should be interesting, I think. <laughs>